this time, I'd like to call the Justice Center Jail Project Committee to order. Uh, any visitors wishing to address this committee about the agenda items only may do so at this time. You'll have five minutes. Linda Noe, 2343 Joe Stevens Road. I've watched the operations of county government for over 20 years, and I've never been more disappointed in the Hamlin County Commission and the county mayor than I am today. My greatest disappointment is the handling, or better put, the mishandling of the jail project. The jail issue has beset the county since at least 2010, and, and actually prior to that with the lack of a certified decent jail. That's the issue. Hamlin County needs a new jail, but do we, we do not need to spend 75 million on an unsafe multi-story jail that the sheriff tells us he cannot staff and with an elaborate new justice center. A little history is needed here because I think about half of you we're not even here in 2017 and in earlier years. In November 27, Mosley Architects presented options A through K. I bring you just one of those options. It was option J, which is a 452 bed detention facility with courts and renovation of the existing Justice Center, 37,900,000. Then there were 2019 estimates. And the next thing we know, we're in May of 2020 with the unveiling of a multi-story jail design and totally new justice center with a price tag of around 65 million for construction costs. And then of course, all the money you've spent on property and demolition and project management fees and architect fees and bond fees and realtor fees and the Hale property and still more to come. Jim Hart with CTAS then reported that the staffing is going to more than double while the sheriff has told you he can't staff the jail he has now. Often overlooked is that the sheriff and jail staff have told you that the multi-story design is less safe for staff and inmates. I could go on and on, but everybody up here already knows, and more and more of the public is finding out that we have a design that is a money pit to build, is unsafe and unstaffable. During all this, the commission refused to allow the people to vote on a bond referendum refused to approve a moratorium to allow just 120 days to review a safer, less expensive, one-level jail. You refused even to give 15 minutes for a presentation by commissioner and citizens supporting a one-level jail. Instead of considering a one-level jail, we have commissioners throwing papers into the audience and other commissioners accusing citizens of being part of a which session and Chairman Shipley violating the constitutional rights of citizens. The whole process has been a sham, an outrage, and a carefully controlled game from the get-go, and it needs to stop now. The citizens of Hamlin County deserve better. The commissioners deserve better. I ask that you not seek bids on the multi-story jail justice center until you fully and openly compare the costs safety and staffing of the multi-story jail design versus the cost, safety, and staffing of a one-level jail with a total renovation of the Justice Center. As I said at the start, we need a new jail. We do not need to spend $75 million on an unsafe multi-story jail that the sheriff has said he cannot staff. Please think again about what Charles Curtis said yesterday. Listen to the people. I think a proposal that could save $30 million, maybe just $20 million, 
maybe 10 million, is a good idea and worth taking 60 to 90 days to look at. Then if you still feel that the multi-story jail is the only way to go and we've got to spend 65 million and the 10 million or so on the, all the other costs, then it, it makes more sense after you have looked at this one level. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Ann Horner. I live at 6245 Woodcrest Drive. I have several questions and concerns about the jail that I'm sure most of your, that by most of your demeanors, I will not get answers to. Nevertheless, I'm going to ask them in hopes of making you think. Why are you hell bent on this monstrosity when there is a safer, more reasonable option? Why would you not listen to Commissioner Neesmith? But an even better question might be why you have not been good stewards of tax monies over the years and maintain the current jail? Why should you be trusted to maintain a new building? What about that money you claim to make from state inmates? We all know it goes to the general fund instead of a separate jail fund. Why have you spent that money? What have you spent that money on, Mayor Britton and commissioners? Why don't you address that? It will continue to be a problem. How can those of you who voted to give the mayor his wish on the jail live with their decisions? So many people struggle to pay their taxes and your job and responsibility is to them. Why don't you speak up for your constituents? We need a jail, but not this one. It won't be safe for employees or inmates. This point has already been well made. Are you possibly being pressured by, are you possibly being pressured to push this through? Or are you benefiting by going along with it? Legitimate questions considering the circumstances. Your reputations are at stake on this one. Taxes must be raised, so why don't you make the best decision for people, the people of Hamlin County, instead of helping the mayor check things off his wish list? Mayor Britton, why don't you try to consider the safest, most affordable option instead of causing a greater burden on the people of the county? Um, oh, I forget, you seem to enjoy enslaving us in so many ways. Like some commissioners, you fooled the people, including myself, into thinking you were the conservative option to vote for. What a crock. It's all about power and money, and look what I did. You aren't fooling me anymore. I hope you can live with yourselves while the poor and elderly struggle to pay for your dream. I hope you can live with yourselves when someone dies in a medical emergency or altercation because of understaffing and stairs to climb. Why can't you see? Why don't you care? Why won't you look at other options? Pride and arrogance sure looks that way as time goes on. I pray you'll consider a change before it's too late. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Emily Reitenauer. I'm 1200 West 6 North Street. And I um, am coming to follow up on the uh, petition that I submitted to you all uh, several months ago about Paulson <coughs> Jail. And part of the um, reasons for that is that um, our county officials are keeping people in jail um, in an unconstitutional way. I'm, I apologize, I'm a little flustered. My car battery died, so I just barely squeaked in. Um, but you all might have heard that the lawsuit against the county has been upheld and a preliminary injunction has been upheld um, by Judge uh, Corker in Greenville, and this is it. I encourage you all to read it online. Um, it found that we, the county, the sheriff, and the Judge Collins and clerks are engaging in unconstitutional practices by keeping people um, in jail before their trial and denying them an individualized bail hearing, and the judge requires that people have an individualized bail hearing going forward. Um, the sheriff and the judge have not to my knowledge, made forward motion yet, but they will have to. Um, the Tribune has not covered this story adequately, but other newspapers will, including the Knoxville News Sentinel, the Tennessean, and probably National. 
Our county is um, becoming infamous for our uh, an unjust and unconstitutional pretrial practices. And I know that you all are not judges and lawyers, and there is only so much you can do. But one of the things that you can do is uh, not build a huge new jail to keep people in uh, when we are already keeping too many people in jail. Approximately 50% of people in the jail currently will probably be released because of this order. So if that's the case, that throws up off all of your professional projections that you've had done um, for what the need for the new jail will be. Um, and you could probably end it all if you would institute pretrial support programs um, that have been recommended to the county and then the judge would have something to do. Right now they're afraid that they're gonna have to be in court 24 seven. Um, the Greenville judge said that that argument was a sky is falling argument and completely dismissed it um, as ridiculous. So that's not gonna stand. And if the Greenville judge does come down and say, you um, are not complying with my order and I'm gonna give you a program uh, that will probably end up being a lot more expensive for the county in the long run. So now you have an opportunity to craft a pretrial program that works and that um, is not as expensive as something the federal judge might insist that you do. I know part of the impetus for building this jail today or in the next two years um, is because you're afraid of <clears throat> a federal judge, getting in trouble with a federal judge. Well, we have gotten in trouble with a federal judge already. And I respectfully want to point out that I do not think you are focusing on the correct problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm a taxpayer, you're a taxpayer. I just don't think that we need to spend $75 million for a jail. I think you can do it for less. And like Mr. Neesmith did, give you a referendum, wanted to talk about it for 15 minutes, and Z wouldn't let him do that. I don't think you care what the citizens think. But I'll tell you what, I believe it's going to come back to get you because you can't do people like that and get by with it. It's gonna cost you as well as it's gonna cost me. And it may cost you more because you all are making the decision. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Tony Stradazulo, 609 East Louise Avenue. I'm here to speak tonight about this jail. Not just the government sector, but the private sector is having an extremely difficult time finding good labor. You, everywhere you go, you see signs, more signs that say help wanted, now hiring, than sale signs. It's almost ridiculous. How do you all expect to be able to put that many government employees onto a development that's just gonna be overwhelming in comparison to what we even had. Why are we even looking to build a jail that's gonna hold so many inmates? Are you guys that afraid that the police system is doing that horrible of a job or that's the type of people you're inviting into this area is the criminals and the people that need to be locked up? You think that we need that many places for inmates? It's ridiculous, think about that. We need to do something to Solve the problem with the crime rate, if that's what the issue is. I don't see that we need to have a facility of that size, of that demeanor. We need to figure out what we need to do today to start diminishing the amount of inmates that we have, to bring people in here. I saw a <laughs> survey that Hammond County put out um, that was online, and I, I tried to fill it out, and it booted me out at the end. And one of the things was, what do I think invites people into Hamlin County to want to move here? I came from South Florida. Listen, I'm ready to get out. This place is horrible. It's so behind on its times. Nothing inviting here. 
nothing for a family to do. Uh, you try to go fishing, and, and you, there's cliffs everywhere. There's not even a place to go fishing with a family. You, you can't invite people here if there's not things for families to do. You say, well, sports. Great, my kids played sports for three uh, years, and then there wasn't enough coaches. So they couldn't play for the following year. Then the following year, they couldn't play again. You can't even find coaches, and you want to find employees? You all need to step back, because when this place is built, and you can't run it, it's just going to be ran to the ground. You're going to have mediocre employees. You're going to have more lawsuits. You're going to have the same problems. You're not solving any issues by storing more inmates. What is that, for funding? You all really need to step back and think about this. This is today. I, I know your all's generation is a little bit older, but listen, I got kids. I'm 40. You know, I would love to stay here. I didn't move just to move. I moved for a place where I thought, hey, I'd be able to take my kids out fishing, be able to go out four-wheeling, dirt biking, hang out, trails. That stuff's not here. Listen, the weather is horrible. Five months out of the year, it rains, it's cold. It's not even cold enough to snow and go out snowboarding. It shuts down. I feel like my kids are losing four months every year out of their life because they're stuck inside of a house because there's nothing else to do. But you're worried about spending money for criminals. Is it because you're afraid of the, this generation and they ain't got nothing to do? And they're harbored up into places doing drugs and stuff and not being able to prosper and thrive. We want a thriving committee, community. We don't want to jail people, have them on probation <clears throat> and papers. That's not what we want. We really need to consider. We can't afford that. There's a lot of people that can't afford to live as it is, and you want them to pay more. Please, uh, reconsider. Think about this. We don't want issues down the road because we want to do something today. Let's figure out what we can do now and maybe grow in five years if need be. But if the crime rate is bad in five years, listen, all these police that are cooped up everywhere, I drive down the street and there are these little cubby holes behind buildings in the school parking lot here and there, not even where people can see. What are they doing on private property anyways? They're not allowed to be on private property. They need to be out visible where people could see. I've got 20 seconds left. Listen, my wife was told to move and to leave into another room. There's no reason that we can't fit more people over here. This COVID crap is ridiculous. All of you are less than six feet apart. This is crazy. Nobody in here but a couple of people have masks on. Nobody people downstairs. This is ridiculous. We need to figure this out. Anyone else wish to speak? If not, we'll move forward. Item 3A, uh, old business, there is none. New business, 4A, presentation of the new Justice Center Jail, Brian Payne from Mosley Architects. Thank you, Commissioners. How y'all doing? Thank y'all for having us tonight. Um, appreciate it. Good to see y'all again. Um, I've been asked to update you guys on the progress of the project and recap some of uh, the design, so re-familiarize everyone with it and kind of walk through. Put together the agenda here that uh, what we're going to go over this evening. Uh, a project overview will be the first thing that I will go over with you guys. Then we're going to talk about operations and some uh, safety, uh, staff safety strategies that we've developed in, as part of the project. Uh, I'm going to share with you the project imagery that you, many of you, are, most of you have already seen all that again, but I just want to bring it back to your uh, memory. Um, we're going to go over some energy efficiency strategies that are part of the project. Um, 
and we're going to go over the status of where we are, uh, the review and approval process, and then we're going to go over next steps. So project overview is first. Yeah, go ahead and advance it one more time. Just to recap, this is the site plan for the project. I'm going to orient you here. This is the existing Justice Center here, which way is most everybody looking? <laughs> maybe, maybe I should orient it so most of you are looking. This is the existing Justice Center here. Uh, the existing EMS building is here, and the existing um, Helen Ross McNabb Center is here. Uh, the area that you see there kind of in a brownish orange is the new building. Um, this is uh, West 3rd North, and this is Jackson Street here. Um, the main entrance, uh, the new entrance, the main entrance to the facility is, will be here. Uh, folks coming to the facility will come, and there's a, there's a new parking here for uh, public and visitors. Uh, there's a new staff parking lot here, and we're extending the existing staff lot in this area here. Um, resting officers and people coming to the facility uh, will come in a secondary entrance. That's the existing, um, in the existing exit off onto Jackson Street now, which is here. That will be repurposed as an entrance for arresting officers. They will come in, and they'll come around through a gated entrance here to the back of the facility. There's a vehicle sally port in this location, and all of this area behind the facility here is within the secure, secure uh, fence perimeter of the facility. There's an exit gate here. Um, both this gate and the gate here are controlled by central control inside the facility, so people can't just uh, come in and out of those gates without the staff uh, giving them access to do so. Um, just some highlights of the, uh, of the project here. We've got a total on-site of 280 parking spaces, uh, 164 new and 116 existing. Uh, went over the secure perimeter there. Uh, we've got secure fencing from the corner of the existing Justice Center around to the new Justice Center here, and then from the back around and up to uh, between the Helen Ross McNabb and the new facility up to West 3rd North, where a gate is, operable gate is here. Inside the fence perimeter, we've picked up a, a, a few secure judges parking uh, in this area. Um, they have their a separate entrance, which is, secu which is secure. They will come in, they'll park here and come into the bu building kind of in this knuckle area here between the two, uh, between the detention center and the justice center here. There's an elevator and staircase for their access uh, at that point. Um, like I mentioned, we have separate entrances for uh, vehicles for uh, 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 visitors and public coming to the facility and staff entrance here. Um, the existing facility, if you recall, um, this portion of the building is the four-story detention center. This portion of the building is the one-story justice center. I'll orient you that way because the next slide will, will go through the floor plans. This is the lowest level of the uh, detention portion of the building. Uh, again, uh, 3rd North Street is here, Jackson Street is here. This is the vehicle sally port where arresting officers will come into. The door will close behind them. They can, they can you know, offload their arrestee into the facility. facility. Uh, this bluish green area here is booking and intake. Uh, there's, holding, there's an array of holding cells, medical areas, so that folks can um, uh, be assessed, medically assessed as they come into the facility. There's property storage in this, in this zone and dress out in this zone. Um, we have strategically located the, the medical area of the building kind of in this grayish area, if you will, where I'm circling there. Uh, it's in proximity uh, to the booking and intake area, but it's also in proximity to the elevators that take you up and down in the facility, which are located kind of right this is you know, the main corridor, which kind of leads back around to some court holding on this level. There's, a, there's an elevator here that will, it's a secure elevator strictly for inmate movement um, that will take them up to the court levels on level one of this portion of the building. Uh, this brownish gray area here is kitchen and laundry facilities. There's a loading dock in this area of the building. And this kind of pinkish area here is a uh, work release dorm. Um, we wound up with 37 beds in the work release dorm. 
Um, they have their own uh, entrance uh, in and out of the facility here so they, they don't commingle with uh, inmates in other parts of the facility. If you recall, we talked about that several months ago. Uh, some highlights. Um, I kind of went through most of that. Um, probably since last time we spoke, one thing in kind of reaction to the COVID situation um, that's come about in our country, we did add some negative pressure cells in the medical area. Those are located here. So if you have an infectious issue in your po inmate population, you have some ability to manage that until you know those, those uh, in infected inmates need to be transported elsewhere. <coughs> so that, that's kind of in this zone here. Uh, I mentioned court holding area and loading docks, and I think that's kind of that on the lowest level. If you don't mind going up to the next level, Chris. Okay, this is the first floor level, and this portion of the building here is the first floor of housing. The area that we were just looking at, the book and intake kitchen area, are directly below this portion of the building. This portion of the building is the one-story court and admin uh, portion of the building. Uh, overall, uh, and I should say, uh, over the housing portion of the building, there's a mezzanine as well. Um, each one of these two larger pods here have 39 beds. The two smaller pods that you see there have 19 beds each. And that's replicated on the level two and level three as we move up into the building. Um, the overall project uh, square footage is roughly 199,000 square feet. We've incorporated three courtrooms, as you recall, into the design. Uh, clerk of court space is along this bar here. Uh, community services is here in, in the yellowish uh, color there. And jail administrative uh, suite is in the light blue here. Um, if you recall, and I'll just remind you guys that we talked about uh, very early on three distinct <coughs> Uh, in the design of the project. We want to make sure that the public is separate from staff, and staff and public are separate from judicial movement. That's the three, and, and, uh, and inmate movement. That was the three uh, paths there, uh, public, inmate movement, and judicial staff. So if you recall, uh, the main public entrance to the facility is here. Uh, everyone coming to the facility will go through an off, uh, checkpoint and screening station at this, at this location. The public is allowed to go kind of down this main corridor here. They can access the clerk of court zone. They can access the, um, the courtrooms, video visitation. We've located off that main lobby. There's public restrooms here, uh, and attorneys have access to inmates, uh, inmate visitation area off that main corridor. So we've kept the public main movement uh, to this bluish zone of the building here. Judicial movement, we'll talk about, like I mentioned on the site plan, there's some uh, secure judges parking kind of off the end of the building here. Judges can come in through a door. There's an elevator and stair here that will bring them up to the judicial corridor, kind of behind the courtrooms. The judges' offices and administrative suites are kind of located behind the courtrooms. So judges uh, coming to court would come in from the backside of of the courtrooms from their judicial quarter, where public would come in the front off the public quarter. So we separated those two movement paths. And the third movement path is inmate movement path, which you want to keep separate as well. The area here in green between the two courtrooms is inmate holding. If you recall on the lower level, I mentioned we had some court holding on the lowest level, and there was an elevator on that level that brought you up to an elevator here in the greenish um, zone there. So, and Inmates could be held on the lowest level. They could be held on this level. Those inmates going to court, that is. Um, and then they are fed into the courtrooms via doors from the uh, left and right here going in uh, from that holding area. So we kept inmate movement separate from those other courts. So all three, uh, it, those three distinct paths are a very important safety feature of the design um, that we uh, talked about and discussed early on, and uh, we've kept that uh, consistent through the entire design process. Um, um, I've got an animation of the courtroom. Uh, we can play that at the end if you guys want to see that. We've we've had a number of meetings, number of conversations over the course of the project with 
all of the judges, uh, we've, we've developed an animation of the courtroom so they kind of could see what the courtroom looked like, the finishes. The judge could actually sit behind the bench and kind of see what they see. You could go sit in the jury box and see what a, what a juror would see. You could sit in the public gallery and see what they would see. So we've had a, a, a you know, in-depth, number of in-depth conversations with the judges. I think they're very excited about the um, courtrooms that we've got developed into the project. Just a couple of highlights of the three courtrooms there. Uh, the courtroom A is for general sessions and juvenile courts. Gallery seating is the public seating area. It's, it's uh, sized for approximately 140 seats there. Courtroom B is for general, general sessions division one courts and the gallery seating is sized for 110. And courtroom C is the criminal and circuit court. That courtroom is the one that's modeled here. That's the jury courtroom. Uh, and the public uh, gallery seating area there is 156 seats. And again, we can show that animation at the end if you guys want to see that. So kind of see what's going on there. Um, moving up to levels th uh, two and three, uh, these two floors of housing are pretty much identical. Um, again, it's the same configuration, kind of a wagon wheel, if, you, if you're familiar with that term. Um, there's a centralized elevated control room kind of in the center where you see this diamond area. Uh, staff um, are able to access that control room uh, via a stair there. They have good line of sight down into each of the housing pods um, and, and it, they can see all the way through the housing pod and they can see the outdoor rec space beyond. Um, couple of, uh, there's the bed count and the core size. Overall, we're at 121 beds total in the design for the facility. Uh, the core of the facility, things like your laundry, your kitchen, those are what we consider core spaces. Overall, it's size for uh, about 650 there. Uh, and there's your breakdown of your bed count. We have had, uh, like we met with um, the court court folks and, and um, county staff, we've had a lot of conversations with county maintenance uh, through this design process. One of the big drivers, uh, not only from a safety perspective, but also from a maintenance perspective, excuse me, uh, was this rear chase design. Uh, all of these housing pods, you'll see kind of a bar behind the holding cells there. That's, that's, a, that's maintenance chase. Uh, maintenance can access everything they need to access behind those cells without ever having to go into the housing pod. There may be occasion where something's in the housing pod they still have to go in there for, but the primary servicing that they would have to do would be from the rear chase. Um, it, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's better for the maintenance staff uh, so that they don't have to, and it's better for officer uh, safety and inmate safety too because you don't have that mixing of maintenance staff bringing ladders and tools and things like that on a continuous basis into the, into the go rooms of the, of the housing pods. Likewise, we, we've had a number of conversations on the finishes uh, through those meetings with the maintenance staff and the county staff. Um, we have, uh, we're, we've provided uh, very durable finishes. They're not over the top. Um, they're not uh, overly expensive uh, uh, finishes. Matter of fact, in the, in the holding areas, we're talking about painted uh, CMU block walls and, and finished uh, concrete floors is what we're talking about in, in, the, in the inmate area. So that's, it's meant to be more durable and more maintenance resistant finishes uh, and, and therefore, you know, we're not spending a whole lot of money on those, those finishes. Now we do have a little bit nicer finishes in the public areas of the building, but that's because um, they're, they're also very durable finishes and this building's meant to last you guys for, you know, 50 years. Uh, and it's a 50-year building, and, and you know you want the the maintenance uh, to not have issues with finishes in the public zones of the building too. So they're all meant to be very durable, uh, easily cleanable, and easily maintainable. Let's talk a little bit about operations and staff safety. Uh, some of the strategies that we've incorporated into the design. Some, most of you are probably familiar with the pictures here that I'm showing. This, this is pictures of, a, of another facility, but the design is very similar uh, to your facility. What you see on top here is the elevated control room, and you see through the windows beyond the housing uh, pod below. Officers 
would be in this elevated control room and they have full line of sight, like I mentioned before, into the day room below. They can see beyond into the rec yard that you kind of see beyond. Uh, and, and so it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's very good from an officer safety standpoint because it's kind of an indirect supervision. Uh, inmate, or, uh, officers are not in the housing pod uh, in a direct supervision with the inmates constantly, so it's better for staff safety from that perspective. Um, one of the things um, that we've done in this design is it's intentionally we, limit it, we are limiting the movement of inmates. Um, we have, you know, rec yards at each housing pod. So, you know, if, if an inmate's in a housing pod, uh, they don't have to go elsewhere in the facility when it's time for their, their recreation. They, they can stay within that housing pod. Each level of housing, we've included a medical triage area. So if, you know, if there's a situation, the nurse and the medical staff would come up to that floor to the medical triage area rather than the inmates going down constantly and move, moving. That is uh, officer safety. It, it reduces the, the amount of staff you have to have for moving inmates and things of that nature. We have program space on each floor level. So programs, again, stay on the housing level. Inmate, the whole idea is that you're limiting the movement of inmates. So they're not having to have uh, sheriff staff, detention staff, move them uh, throughout the facility and go to these things. Um, so basically the, what I'm saying is inmates stay on that floor. Um, you know, unless it's a, a major medical issue that they have to go to medical or even remove from the facility or they're going to court, they pretty much stay on that, that housing level that they're assigned to. Uh, I mentioned the elevated control rooms earlier. I won't go back over that. But one thing, and I think one benefit of having a multi-story uh, design is each floor really becomes a classification type. Um, it allows the detention staff to classify the inmate population uh, it, it, it better because, in essence, each floor becomes its own miniature jail, if you will. Uh, we talked about strategies of maybe the third floor becomes entire, your entire female population. So you're not mixing uh, males and females on the same floor. You can isolate them, if you will, on, on a floor level of the building. So in a way, in a way having a multi-story facility is better for, for potential classification. Some images, um, you guys have seen all of these before. Um, this is the main entrance, the main public entrance to the facility. Um, we designed this building, it's, it's not over the top, it, but it is a very dignified civic presence. We were very mindful uh, knowing where this building was gonna be placed, its proximity to the Rose Center, its proximity to the historic courthouse that we're in. So it's meant to be uh, fit within the context of the community but it's also meant to give that very dignified civic presence and, and that sense of justice that, um, that you get from courthouses uh, in, in, in historic courthouses especially, <coughs> if you will. This is a view looking back. Uh, this is the multi-story detention facility. We're still standing in the public and staff parking lot. This is the vehicle sally port that I mentioned when we were going through the site plan. Interior-wise, this is a view that you've seen before of the public lobby. We've tweaked the finishes a little bit uh, since this rendering, and I haven't updated, sorry about that. Uh, we've reduced the amount of windows, and we've eliminated the wood up high there to, again, uh, you know, cut back on some savings for the county, but still have a nice uh, uh, facility. This is gonna be a very high volume public space. People are gonna be coming and going quite a bit in this so it's sized appropriately for all that uh, movement of people, if you will. That picture, if you will. This is a new image that you guys have not seen, that public <coughs> corridor uh, that I made mention of. You can see kind of the entrances off to the left-hand side of where the uh, courtrooms are. Uh, it's, it's a little bit wider corridor because, again, there's going to be a lot of people uh, moving back and forth. It's oversized. You might be able to you know, put some seating out there. Uh, in front of the courtrooms that folks can wait uh, as they come in and out of court. Uh, so it's meant to be a, a very high traffic area, very durable finishes, <coughs> and we capture some daylight, so it's a very nice, inviting, pleasing space. Some energy uh, strategies and performance uh, numbers. Um, this is, I just highlighted here <coughs> some of the strategies that we've 
been looking at in this design and, and what we've incorporated in the design. I won't go through all of this in detail, but I will point out a few things, like from the architectural perspective, we're going with a reflective roofing membrane. In other words, it's not the old dark uh, black roofing membrane that absorbs rays from the sun. It's a white membrane, so it reflects, uh, it, improve, it improves the HVAC system in the facility performance. Um, you know, reflective interior surfaces, it, it, you know, it allows the natural light to bounce better and, and you know, make, your, make the space feel more inviting, more uh, light and airy. Uh, we've incorporated a number of mechanical electrical strategies. We've got high efficiency HVAC systems. I'll go over some of the numbers in a, in a, moment, here, a moment here so you guys can see some of the, um, the, the numbers that we've got. Um, you know, LED lighting uh, throughout the facility, both interior and exterior lighting is all LED. Um, we've installed, uh, we're designed for installing occupancy sensors in the staff area so that controls your light, your energy use. You know, when staff areas aren't occupied at nighttime and nobody's in that office, occupancy sensor will cut off that light so you're saving energy. Uh, so it's, it's, it's better in the long run, it's better for maintenance, it's better for, for uh, the longevity of the facility. Um, one thing, and I'll go into this a little bit in the next slide, is the roof we've designed to be uh, solar PV ready. Uh, Chris, if you will, I'll go to that next slide. We're not, um, we're not installing uh, solar panels on, on the building as part of the project, but the, but the building is, we, we do, we've identified a couple of opportunities that if the county ever chooses to add solar panels to the facility, we've identified a couple of spaces that that could happen. And we've kind of run some quick numbers to just kind of look at what that would do for the county um, if that you know, were to ever happen. And these are based on today's technology. So you know, we know that uh, solar energy is one of those things that's an ever evolving uh, technology. Things are always being improved. So based on today's technology, if you were to fill these blue zones that I've identified here uh, with, uh, solar PV panels, you could expect to generate somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the building's consumption, energy consumption. Um, that's not a lot, but again, you know, with improvements in technology, that number should grow uh, in the future if the county ever chooses to do so. And one more slide on energy. Um, the, we did an analysis of the heat and air portion of the design. Um, what we have proposed uh, in the project, um, basically over a baseline code compliant minimum um, building, what we have designed is we expect to perform at least 10% better. We, so you should have a 10% reduction in your energy cost over a baseline code compliant facility. Um, part of that number, there's about 196,000 in first cost that's in the design uh, to achieve that. But what we're expecting is about a $76,000 a year savings on your energy or your annual energy usage and your maintenance. Um, so that pays for itself roughly in two and a half years. So basically the first cost number of that, you know, almost $200,000, which is minimal add to the project, You'll, you'll, it'll pay for itself, roughly, in the energy savings within two and a half years. So again, that was a quick analysis we did, but um, the mayor asked me to do that and, and share with you guys so that you could see that. I think that was important for uh, you guys to see. Yeah. Where we are, uh, status of the reviews and approval on the project. This is um, all the approvals that we have that we have to go through uh, with reviewing agencies. Uh, I've broken them down into site plan reviews and building reviews. Uh, as you will see, we are only lacking one uh, with the sewer, the PDEX sewer. We are expecting any day now, uh, sometime the month of December, we should expect to see approval uh, from them for that. Uh, where we are with the building, these are the three agencies, uh, Tennessee Corrections Institute, the State Fire Marshal's Office, and the city's building permit. Uh, we have already submitted uh, once already to both uh, Tennessee Corrections Institute and the State Fire Marshal's Office that both those agencies have made comments. We are currently in the process of responding to those comments 
and we should be resubmitting to them late this week, early next week. So uh, we fully expect the month of December to have approval from those agencies uh, to move forward. And uh, we expect at the same time I resubmit to TCI and State Fire Marshal's Office, we're going to submit uh, to uh, City of Morristown for building permits. Uh, so we fully expect that we should wrap up all of our uh, approvals by the end of the month. And so next steps on the project. This, I put this together basically just to put out the targets and target milestones of where we think uh, the next steps are. Um, I believe we are coming to you guys tonight um, for approval to proceed with bidding the project. So if, if we're successful, we should have that, uh, that works targeted for this month. Following that, uh, if, if we're successful with getting that approval, We'll be ready to advertise for bid. Uh, we expect that to happen in the month of January. Um, and we'll be able to receive bids uh, towards the end of February. Uh, and then we should be able to award the project in the month of March. Uh, and if we're successful with that track, um, we expect construction to begin roughly in April. And we're a uh, time frame of about 24 months to build this project. So owner occupancy would be roughly uh, in April of 2023. Um, I think, Tony, you want to come up and we can go through um, numbers if you want to do that. Um, if there's any questions on anything that I can answer before we get into that, I'll be happy to. Uh, how common of a design is that? I, I would say it's very common. Um, we, we built more of those in the state of Tennessee or around the area? Anywhere? We've built a number of them in North and South Carolina. Three stories? Three stories down here. I think that's how you, you look at it from that perspective. Cost-wise, I think it's the 
and you can't a lot of so so we know Ken here, I don't have to add out more than right now, sixty eight thousand people here. And we're growing and I hope to continue with that. Okay. And we're gonna have issues. I mean it won't be if you've got county more you probably still have. In twenty thirty I have a question. Uh, speaking of, you made a comment about staffing being reduced. Uh, Jim Hart came and gave us his staffing study. And in his staffing study, he gave us a number. I think it was around 120. And that was if we were at full capacity and um, everybody had to be there, uh, knowing that we may not need that many to begin with, but you made a comment about reducing staff. Have you found ways to reduce staff in your design since Jim Hart's study? No, I told him that just because I know he's not a reporting state. He was That's fine. With this design for, because of having things like your outdoor rec space or medical areas and sure. playground spaces on the same floor, sure. this design compared to another design that does not do that, you would have less staff in this design because you're not you're limiting that number of pending movements. If you have a different design where you have those maybe like one outdoor rec for the entire facility, well, programmatically you've got to move those inmates to that outdoor rec, so you've got to have staff to do that. So right. that that was my point. In that I, I just recalled uh, Mr. Hart bringing that study to us, and then I specifically asked the question: How much difference would the staff be for a multi-level? to a one-story, 600-bed facility, and, and he, he alluded to the fact that it would be basically the same, maybe 10 less on the one level, uh, because when you have so many inmates, you have to have that much staff regardless. I, I just think it's something that gets lost in the mix. Everybody, um, you know, we have some that think it would be less staffed if we built one level. I, I mean, I, I just, I heard a study that said differently, and do you agree with that? One last thing, the, the pods that, that we're building, are, will all that be constructed on site? Are the pods, will they be constructed on site? Will it all be built on site, or is there some being built? So the actual cells uh, where the inmates reside, right. those are prefabricated. That's what I wanted to hear. Uh, they are, they're fabricated off-site. They're shipped to the site as a six-sided box. Yes. And then the contractor put, puts those in place and connect, makes the final connection. Good deal. Those Those... The prefabrication process allows that plant to put the door on, put the yeah. bed in, the, the toilet fixture, paint it, the light fixture, those type of things. That was in Texas or something, wasn't it? Or there's multiple. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah. there's multiple places. All right, that, that's what I wanted to confirm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have a hearing problem, so I you, you may have already answered my question. Uh, what about the... Um, the wagon wheel approach with with pods. I, I've heard very little discussion about that. So the what I've heard called a uh, wagon wheel, right. a radial design. Right. Central facility and then halls going out to pods for inmates. Uh, I mean, in essence, this design is very similar to that. In okay. other words, you've got a 
you've got a centralized um, um, uh, control room, right. uh, staff control room, and then the housing pods are kind of radiating off that central core, <coughs> kind, of, kind of in a wagon. Wagon wheel, yeah, right. Uh, look, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there may be some subtle differences in the facility design that you're describing versus what we've designed, yeah. but, but in essence, they're very close. Now, my, my concern primarily was the necessary people to run the facility. Um, we're, we're somewhat limited in this area for recruiting people to run a facility of that, of that nature and of that size. And the bigger we make it and the harder it is to run, uh, we're going to have a real pretty building with nobody but crooks in it. I wasn't referring to the commission. <laughs> Well, I thought I was in the process of asking the question. Well, maybe I missed you. <laughs> oh. um, I tell you, I'll let you continue, and maybe I can put it together myself without confusing everybody and me, too, again. you to staff appropriately. In other words, each floor is, if you will, kind of a mini jail. Uh, and if you need that floor, you staff that floor. Uh, if you don't need that floor, you don't staff the floor. Uh, it's been, you know, if your inmate population grows all of a sudden to 621 inmates, well, you got to have staff to reflect that number too. So, you know, that's, I think there's some uh, give and take uh, and allows the county to grow, the, the facility to grow with the county's needs. I'd like to make a comment at this point. As far as the size of the jail, uh, that was determined by the recommendations of the employees in our current jail. When we first started this project, some of them wanted 900 beds. And so we're winding up with much less than that. But we listened to those individuals and we have incorporated what, you know, they want. negative pressure room cells in the lower level and I had not heard that before is that a requirement in PCI it is not it, uh, we talked about that with them uh, <coughs> they they recommended it was a good idea to have who is they uh, TCI I'm sorry okay. uh, TCI um, did, th there are two cells uh, in the medical whole, uh, the medical area uh, that have the capability of being negative pressure cells. And basically what that means is you re you're regulating the mechanical system to put those rooms in negative pressure so, so you're not pulling air in uh, from the other surrounding area. So if someone's, uh, you know, got an infection, if you will, you don't want to spread that from one space to the other. You want to kind of contain, contain that with the HVAC system in those two cells. Is that a laminar flow? Does it take laminar flow to make that happen? I'm not the engineer. I don't know, Jim. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm curious as to what the cost is of that, because that's the first time that I've heard that. It's, it's, it's negligible, I would say, with what we've already designed for the building. Um, we, we, we were able to just easily add that as part of what we already designed. Um, and, again, it, was, it developed through kind of a reaction to the current situation we've been facing with this year and, you know, discussions with county staff and TCI, they thought it was a good idea to have that for future needs. Well, when we, we were doing this prior to COVID with negative pressures, you know, and sometimes TB was a big concern prior to any kind of communicable disease. It's, it's in your interest to be able to kill those inmates effectively to get out of that facility to a hospital. You need to protect the rest of your population from that way. More on everybody's mind now. Uh, uh, some of those strategies. So I, I, I 
will say we have we have had some uh, in-depth discussion about COVID strategies and how that may affect the design of it. It's good. And um, we've implemented some common sense uh, measures <coughs> like uh, screen, you know, screen interaction for perception and that sort of thing. Uh, we've also uh, tied on the operation side, we've identified potentially some um, CARES Act uh, benefits. Uh, to introduce maybe a body scanner, which we would have wanted to have, have anyway, that's actually paid for through that program that exists now. And this is an expensive piece of equipment that really helps safety and security when you're processing new inmates. Having those electronic body scanners, like what you go to at the airport, that's over a $150,000 device. We found a way to, to apply for that money, so it's not no cost to the county to have that. So we've been thinking about uh, those type of things, and to the extent that COVID has created opportunities, uh, we can take advantage of the benefit of the county we've done that. Uh, my concern is still the ability to get qualified people in to service a facility of this of this type. We've got a gentleman up here that's quite well versed in it. He's, um, I'm not even exactly sure what your title is anymore, but if I had a jail question, he's the one I'd go to. Uh, are we going to be able to hire and train the people to, uh, to adequately run this facility if we build it the size you're discussing? I think uh, you know the, the new facility uh, isn't going to solve all our hiring, you know, issues, but it will attract a lot more people uh, just because of the, the design that we've figured out with with Mosley and PCI. And one of the problems we have now is our jail is so dangerous uh, because of the design itself that we hire people. And a day or two later, they're walking out the door and saying, no way I'm working here. It's too dangerous. And uh, that's one of our big issues. And I think a facility like they've designed uh, will attract you know, attract employees uh, to a safe environment, uh, a, a newer design where they're gonna, they know they're going to be safe. And, they, and it's going to be safer for the inmates. I mean, that the jail we have now is very dangerous for the inmates as well as the staff. And... Uh, I'm not saying that's going to solve all our hiring issues, but I think it's going to definitely attract a lot more people that want to do this job compared to what we have now. Now, we've hired eight people at the end of the year. How many have we got left? We have six right now. Six. we still got six? Yeah. How'd you do that? That, that's better than the time the hiring group before. Yeah, we, we've okay. had before we've hired five or six, and we're lucky if we have two at the end of the month or so. But it's like I said, it's the the design of that facility is drives that. I mean, there's we've had people literally go on break and never come back. Keep up the good work. <laughs> saying earlier in a um, number of conversations we've had with county maintenance uh, staff, one of the big concerns was because it's a multi-facility, they were very, and, and detention staff was worried about this too, about inmates being able to uh, flood uh, their, their, their housing area and that trickling its way down to the floors below, uh, if you will. So uh, to, to remedy that, and we've had a number of conversations, and this was the right solution, we think, there's, there's, there's kind of a two-pronged approach to that. One, we've added floor drains in a lot of places. The rear plumbing chase behind the cells has floor drains. The day room out in front of the cells has uh, floor drains. Uh, and then actually, because some of TCI's requirements, the, there are several corridors that they asked us to add floor drains in as well. Uh, so we, we have floor drains in a number of places, but another uh, portion of that strategy is there is a 
water control uh, system in the building. Um, an officer in the, um, in the control room, if, if you've got an inmate acting up in this pod, uh, has the ability to shut off the water uh, to, to a run of cells. Uh, so if you've, got a, if you've got a toilet that's backed up because somebody's flushed a sheet or tried to flush a uniform or something like that, uh, you can control that water flow uh, so that you know, limits the amount of water that would escape uh, until maintenance can get there and, and do something about it. So the officers have that in, built in to control uh, of the building. So that, that, anything else I can answer on there? Tony, you want to come up and take the lead on this? How you doing? I wanted to update you to see where we are on uh, budget and our target. There's going to be an ask tonight to uh, proceed with bidding uh, and uh, another ask to proceed with a, uh, qualified contractors. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'm going to present what we're trying to do to contain our budget and keep it within uh, what, what we've been designated as our funding. Um, we ran, Burwell Construction ran an independent e uh, control estimate, and at the same time, uh, Mosley, ran one with METS, a uh, METS Consulting Services, who is also an estimator. And we were very, very tight on our estimates together. And we, very, very tight on, we realized that we had a concern of our budget. Uh, and then, <clears throat> so we went and had several meetings uh, with TCI, uh, conferencing back and forth with uh, Brian, with Mosley, and I, and our people and our folks trying to outline how we can achieve our bid target. And our bid target needs to be somewhere between 61 and 63 million dollars. On top of that, we need a contingency somewhere of around a million dollars, an owner's contingency that uh, we can do. So the way we are going to try to achieve this, and, and then let me tell you this, if you have friends in the city, we just uh, completed a uh, bid proce uh, process with that major project, and it came in about 15% below the control estimate, and about 12% below our uh, budget. So there's hope. It's a good bid market right now, and that's what we're anticipating on. Um, uh, we had, like I said, several meetings uh, trying to obtain those uh, ways of getting to that target number. Uh, we met with the county. We met with... Uh, the Tennessee Correctional Institute and uh, a couple of other three people that uh, will help make suggestions. We had a pretty lengthy session with TCI on, and Brian came up with some ways of uh, really uh, changing material selections and that's appropriate to the, the facility and also that are good ideas from TCI. They also su suggested some things. So we're going to also incorporate uh, some ideas like alternates. There may be additive alternates. Uh, we did this similarly with the uh, community center where we had I had alternates. And that way, you get to choose how much money we spend. So as we bid this project, you'll get to see the, the base bid and these alternates. And we can take the alternates that will make sense and get to our target number in our budget. So that, that'll be up to you. We'll come back to you and say, this is what we have. This is what your budget is. This is what we recommend. And um, you made me a list so I wouldn't stumble too much. Um, now we're going to talk about the bid process. So right now, we are out soliciting and receive back some pre-qualifications from interesting party. I think I contacted about a dozen major contractors in the region and I think Mosley did the same thing and we kind of compare notes of where we went out and solicited for these qualification statements. We have uh, five that replied. They just came in so I haven't read through those 196 pages of qualifications but I intend to do that over the weekend and uh, um, so we'll get that back out and see what those how those qualifications look. So that's the second ask. We're going to ask you, can we proceed with the pre-qualification process and, uh, and uh, allow 
any qualified bidders that know the view or qualified to bid the project. <coughs> it makes your project uh, better. It, it, still, uh, it still allows you to have competitive bids amongst like contractors and qualified contractors, and that increases your quality right off the bat. So uh, we took a look at the bid process. Is it advantageous to separate uh, certain packages to go and do a grading package, for example, a grading package versus a building package. And with the way this jail is designed, in the end, we felt like that it was the same. Um, it was an advantage to you, less risk to you to have that all in one package because there's so much with the site that you have to go against the retaining wall and coordinate that. And that, uh, we just thought it was an advantage to speak it as one package to keep track. Now, there may be some things like on the purchase materials. We're still exploring that, making sure that we can do that for some savings and uh, some some equipment that uh, may be, uh, like Dan alluded to, you know, he may be able to get you a body scanner as some sort of credit and, and save that. But we're still exploring that area, too, to help manage that budget. You know, and the bid process will be a lump sum bid. We'll take bids. It'll be a public bid opening among the qualified bidders. Uh, you'll see a base bid, and then you'll say, you know, three, four, five alternates, whatever we deem uh, as appropriate. And then at that point in time, uh, we'll come back to you. We'll have that all outlined. Mosley and I both will check out and make sure the insurance is in order. Bonding companies are AAA best rated. Et cetera, et cetera, and we'll write you a letter of recommendation, and then you can act on it then and choose those alternates based on our budget. And uh, again, he told you the construction was supposed to is uh, scheduled to begin in springtime, which is the perfect time to start this project. And uh, that's, what, that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Wait. <clears throat> so you're saying to us that what now is a good Time to bid a project, yes. and the market. I mean, the bidding market looks real good. Yes. Okay. We have five very on the on the first reading of those five qualified contractors. You got five qualified contractors. I have experience with the ones that Mosley doesn't, and uh, Mosley has experience on a couple that I'm not experienced with. But well, okay. We Thank kind you. Kind of had a backseat meeting here in the Baptist Church, and then. Yeah. And kind of compare notes. <coughs> We've got some good qualified contractors that's interested in the project. Could you elaborate, please, on uh, you said the bid target was 61 to 63 million. Right. Does that mean you expect our bids to come in between that, or are you still expecting, uh, like the city had a 12% budget decrease? I, I, I'm just curious. Where yeah, what? I'm, I'm always taking. Side of the thing, so I, I don't want to say there's going to be a 12% savings. So no, I, I understand. I'm very concerned with, with the control estimates that we have. I'm very concerned with where we need to get to, and that's how come we're taking these other steps because we have to, uh, we'll have to manage this process to make sure that we have uh, competitive bids, and we'll have to make sure that we don't get elaborate and the alternates have got to be to where we can get down to if, if it doesn't come in 12% under. Is there a way to get there while it still gives you a functional jail? Sure. So um, we want to stay away from it. Uh, it's hopeful, but it is a uh, it's a concern. The budget's a concern. So. Okay, but, but it, go ahead. But the only way that we're going to really know the cost of this project is to bid it out. Bid it out to bid. And then we have the option of either accepting that bid or rejecting the bid and taking the scissors to the project to start cutting. So, I mean, everything else right now is going to be an estimate. That's we have no idea until we bid the project out, and when it comes back, then it falls back to us to make a decision at that point. There's no, no other question.
Item 4B, recommendation to commission to accept bids to construct the project. County Mayor. Commission's heard the, the presentation on what the design is and, and um, what has gone into the last nine months of, of really more than nine months of work by the design team. Uh, not only uh, Mosley's people and Brian and, and his folks, but also our staff. Spent a lot of time with, with uh, uh, the jail administration and, and uh, uh, they, they reviewed the plans as well as TCI, as well as uh, the clerk's office and the judges and, and uh, community service folks. They've all been involved in, in reviewing the plans and we think that uh, we've met needs not necessarily wants. Uh, we think that we've met the needs that, that the different departments have, not just now, but in the future. And um, I'm, uh, I'm pleased with what we've come up with. And uh, it's, it's my recommendation that we bid the project and move forward and, and, and bid it using the qualified uh, contractor's method five contractors that have, have submitted their qualifications. They're still being reviewed, uh, but on first blush, all of them are, are highly qualified uh, contractors that have done comparable work uh, as our project. But that's, that's my recommendation to the commission. At this time, I would enter entertain a motion to bid the project and use qualified contractors. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second. I have a second. Follow the roll. Jeff Baker? No. Colleen Arnwine? Yes. Chris Cutshaw? Aye. Randy DeBoard? Yes. Thomas Doty? Yes. Tim Goyne? Aye. Bobby Hahn? Aye. Jim Horner? Yes. Wayne Neesmith? No. Mike Reed? Yes. Howard Shipley? Yes. Yes. Taylor Ward. No. Any nays? Seeing yes, motion passes. Motion passes. Item uh, 5A, items of interest, no action necessary. And this is all I have. And this meeting will be adjourned.